Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast, episode number 119 of the show. Uh, I'm Ramon Mia, I'm here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. Uh, and this week I have eight new reviews just for you folks at home. Uh, and this week that's going to include Awaken Online, book number three, Evolution. After that will be Cocky Lit RPG, Caverns and Creatures, a short story. Uh, then it's going to be Velmora, a Glitch World Lit RPG, Nox Asylum, book number one. That's all one title. Uh, out of that is going to be Guardians of the Round Table, book number one, Dexterity Fail. After that will be The World Jumper, a little bitty adventure, the Digi Dream Chronicles, book number one. And then it will be Free to Play, Restart on Helmo's Strongest, F2 Per, a Lit RPG web novel, volume one. That is a long title. <laughs> then it's going to be Perla Online, book number one, Taurus. Uh, and then after that, it'll be the last but not least, The Lord of the Apocalypse. So there you go. Eight new Lit RPG reviews for you. But before we get into that, we're, of course, going to go into Lit RPG News. And uh, before we begin into Lit RPG News, I want to, of course, uh, address the the change in the show per, uh, formatting notes. Um, uh on the advice of specifically Jeff Hayes uh, of Soundbooth Theater Live uh, and a few other people who have also uh, made similar suggestions about changing the background uh, to make this uh, the video version of the podcast look a little more professional. Uh, I have <laughs> recently purchased uh, a green background screen. Uh, so we'll, I'll just, you know, show you that that, that exists here. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to this episode and then messing around in, in the post uh, to see what interesting backgrounds I'm going to throw in here. Uh, but for you folks at home, um, uh, if you like the, the, the background that you see in this episode, please leave a, a note in the uh, comment section on YouTube or Facebook or, or anywhere you see the podcast or, or hear it. Uh, that way I know that it's actually something that you like, that you think it adds uh, something to the show. Otherwise, pers personally, I'm, I'm really just happy showing my kitchen. Uh, this this takes place taste in my home. Um, I like the kitchen background. It's it's real. It's it's not. Uh, there's no extra at work to, to edit in there. Um, but folks at home, if you if you guys like it more with uh, this interesting background, let me know. That way I know to keep it. Uh, so there you go. Uh, now in actual LBG news. Here we go. Uh, first story, uh, the Dragon Awards nominations. Uh, just a quick reminder, folks, that the nominations for the Dragon Awards are going to be up until July the 20th. Now, this is something that is a fan-based, uh, reader-based um, awards program that that is given out at Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia every year. Um, if you want to nominate your favorite Little RPG authors or any novels or uh, for any categories, please remember to submit it by that date of July the 20th of this year. Uh, so you have about uh, a bit over a month to get that, that date taken care of. Um, also, as a quick reminder for about the rules of it, uh, please do not nominate a book for more than one category. Uh, if that same book is added to more than one category, your nominations will all be nullified. So it's just one of the rules. There are the things for the thing uh, for the submissions. Um, quite a few lit RPG authors will be at DragonCon this year, hanging out. Um, and last year, one of us even got nominated for something. Uh, so your votes and your nominations do matter, ladies and gentlemen. So I'll have a link in the show notes for you. Uh, you can also just go to uh, application.dragoncon.org, and you can putting your nominations there. Later on, they're open voting, and you can actually vote for whoever you like. Okay, uh, in other little RPG news, uh, Daniel Schienhofen, author of the Apocalypse Gate series, uh, was nice enough to actually drop off some alternative artwork uh, on his Facebook page for, for his next Apocalypse Gate story. Uh, it has, you know, I can't remember the name of the exact character. I always call her G Goth Girl in my mind when I'm when I'm thinking of this story. Uh, but it has an alternative image of, of potential artwork for the cover art for book number two. He ultimately just had to go with something else. Uh, but this looks very interesting. I, I, it's a very interesting look for the character. She's not as um, uh, curvy as I would have imagined her from the description and from the, the ultimate cover art that the author chose to go with. Uh, you can see that there's there's a slight, slight change. I'll actually drop down to that for a second so, so you can see it. Um, See, this is the actual cover art that the author chose to use for 
book number two in the apocalypse gate series you know, she's a little more curvaceous um little fuller figured gal which I, I personally appreciate um but that is uh that some extra artwork that he decided to show off this week um some other artwork another author showed off was vasily banco author of the way of the shaman series uh he decided to help uh to show off some artwork he got done for Plinto, which is a character in that series. Um, looking at it, the, the face structure is exactly how I imagine it from the voice, um, from the audiobook versions of the story, like the, the scruff looking face. Um, the armor, though, looks slightly different. I, I noticed like some more details and some weapons, we and some like um, some potion vials and some things to throw. Uh, but also, like, it's like a very pointy armor set, which I was not. Uh, I never imagined, but it's interesting to see that kind of action he's seen. So very cool stuff there. Um, also, in Little Arpentino's last story, uh, a, a couple more authors, unfortunately, have decided to drop out of Kindle Unlimited program uh, because of the issues they have had with Amazon sending them automated letters about suspicious page reads uh, and pulling their novels down this month. It's, an, it's unfortunate. It's happened again this month as well to, to more authors. Authors who got their first warning letter last month. This month, they're getting that second warning letter along with... Um, their accounts being suspended or their books being pulled. Um, and so a couple authors have already decided to just pull their stuff off of Kindle Unlimited and go with the wider release, which means that you can get the books, their books in more places, but um, ultimately it also means a loss of income for any of the authors that choose to do that. Um, because the Kindle Unlimited program, when the authors are getting paid from it, um, can make up, up to 30 to 60% of an author's monthly income, depending on how popular the books are of course and the size of their novels and much of other stuff um so these authors are going to be losing that revenue on a monthly basis but also readers are not going to be able to you know read their books on the kindle limited program which is a little sad for everybody um so please uh, consider supporting them on their patreon pages they both have patreon pages michael chatfield and lars m uh who's the author lars m is the author of the wayward bard series um, they both have Patreon pages. We'll have links in the show notes for those Patreon pages. Um, if you want to go support them there, also remember that um, you're also going to get some very cool rewards if you do choose to support them, including the copies of the uh, latest releases and also early drafts of their stories. So you actually get to read the material that the author's providing earlier than anybody else, including the people on Amazon. So all kinds of great benefits there. Um, so there you go. Um, that's it for Little Bitty News. We have a few stories that are out now that I haven't had a chance to read, but they're fun and they're interesting and they're out currently. Uh, this includes Book 4 in the System Apocalypse series, My Tao Wong, Cities in Chains. Um, I'm super looking forward to reading this. It already has, uh, I think, over like 50 reviews on Amazon. Uh, all very positive things. One of my favorite series. Uh, also out now is Pharaoh book number 10, The Right to Choose. Uh, this is the 10th book in that particular series. Also out is The Alchemist of Altheria. Um, it, it seems to be Little Pity. I scroll through it quickly, but it's out. Uh, also out is The Secrets of Cerulean, The Court of Lincoln Heart. This is book number four in the Barkador book series. Uh, you might have actually remember the, the very first book in the series has this very similar cover. It's called, the I think it's The Builder or something. Um so it's, um, I just happened to come across like, oh, it's right. I read that first book. It was Little RPG. This one is also out. So there you go. Three other books also. Um, also out is Rules Free VR MMO Life by Stuart Gross. Uh, that's actually not the, it's the 12th book, I'm sorry, in that particular series. It's called War in the Wormwood. So if you're a fan of that series and you're looking forward to it, the next one is out. Okay. A few new lit RPG audiobooks as well, including Dodge Tank, Crystal Shards Online, book number one. Great series. A great book, I should say. Um, there are two books in that series, I believe. Uh, also out is Stuff and Nonsense, Threadbare, volume one, put out by Podium Publishing. Um, the cover art on this has changed. This is the one about the, uh, it's like a, a Sunday fantasy RPG world where the, um, where a golem creator uh, makes a, a teddy bear golem and he comes to life and he has some adventures. It gets a reaction in at dark, dark and like, you know, in a few places, uh, but it's a very, very interesting fun story where the main character is a, a golem teddy bear. So fun stuff there. Also got to get a review from us. Okay. Um, on to upcoming lit RPG. These are stories that I know are coming out uh, or are on Amazon as pre-orders. Uh, you can skip ahead if you want to, but there are a few new additions here. Uh, June the 14th, it'll be Killstreak, book number one, We Spawn. Uh, on the June 26th, End of an Era, Project Chrysalis, book number two, will be out. On July the 1st, uh, Daniel Schienhofen, the second book in the Apocalypse Gate series, will be out on July the 1st. It'll be called Valley of Death. Looking forward to reading that one personally. 
big fan of the series. Uh, on July the 10th, it'll be Restart. Uh, on July the 23rd, External Threat, which is the second book in the Reality Bender series. Uh, August the 7th, it'll be Death March. On August the 30th as well. I'm sorry, August the 7th for Death March. August the 30th for Raven and Bex, A Little Bitty Saga, The Binding, book number two by um, Riley Mercer. So that one will be out as well. And so there you go, folks. And remember, authors, if you have anything you want to add to the Lit RPG upcoming list, um, as you know when you're going to publish, uh, please feel free to write in at feedback at geekbyatspodcast.com or litrpgpodcast at gmail.com uh, to let us know. And we'll, we'll be sure to put it up for everyone to see and know about. Okay, uh, on to new releases and reviews. And there you go, right button. Okay, now in new releases and reviews, we have eight new reviews for you folks at home. And of course, we're going to begin with uh, Awaken Online, book number three, Evolution by Travis Bagwell. Uh, this is approximately 600 pages. Um, it is... I think it's more in the print edition of the book, um, but I'm estimating at 600 pages because Amazon doesn't have a page count yet. It's $6.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. I'll read you the author's description. After exiting Awaken Online to find himself holding a knife and standing over two dead bodies, Jason is now being investigated for murder. To make matters worse, Claire has stumbled upon the evidence of Alfred's involvement in the incident, and the CPSC is circling, just waiting for Cerulean Entertainment to make a mistake. With his real life in shambles and his enemies in-game growing in strength, Jason re-enters Awaken Online truly desperate, the game now his only lifeline. He will need to move quickly to complete the old man's quest and obtain the power he was promised. So there we go, all the major plot points and all the major like storylines all told together for you. Okay, uh, the beginning of this in, in-game storyline here, it's a little bit slow. Um, the, the, the novel really does start off at, at, at as soon as the, at the end of book two, onto this one. Um, it's, so it's, a, it's very much a continuation of that. Uh, the cliffhanger um, from the end of book two is resolved a little bit quickly for me. Like that whole situation with him getting arrested for, you know, a, a assumed murder. He has a knife in his hand. Um, that to me looked got resolved a little bit too easily um it, there is a callback later in the novel so it will have to we'll have to wait and see to, to see how that actually resolves um but it's a good addition to the series as, as, as a novel uh the, again the beginning of this novel is a little bit slower than the other ones um on, on the action side but after the about the 25 percent mark at that point from the end of the novel things get really actiony so it's a really good it's still a good actiony addition to the series um the real life storyline with claire searching for evidence of what alfred is uh, the ai is doing surprisingly good part of the story there is an expanded real life part of the story this time i think in book two that was a little bit muted this one it is expanded a little bit more so just be aware of that um the um the in-game storyline, the stuff that happens inside of Awaken Online, um, it's good. It's very entertaining, but it's also very familiar. A lot um, There is less new things that happen in the in-game version. You can tell that the author um, very much spent a lot of time trying to mix between um, the real-life storyline and, and the in-game storyline. Um, and I think the, the, a nice balance was struck, but it, it definitely more information on the real life storyline was given this time around. Um, the end of the story, of course, is very action-y filled, very intense. Uh, so overall, a very good read. Uh, there are a few moments of interesting contemplation where the main character talks with one of the developers uh, and then the, you know, offer the AI about what the consequences of time compression are uh, for, for society, like who's going to want to live like their regular, you know, 80 year life when they can live four times that in the game kind of stuff and and the the consequences of society kind of realizing that as the game becomes more popular so i always like those parts of the series where um there is an introspective uh discussion about like oh the effects of technology or or specifically virtuality or some other aspect of this um system on on a larger society because so often in our or in these liberty stories it's just oh action adventure great stuff but you know taking a, a moment to kind of thinking about like the real life consequences adds like another level of like interest to these kinds of stories, which was one of the things that's kind of a hallmark of, of this particular series. Um, overall, um, oh, sorry, uh, game mechanic wise, everything is kind of the same. Um, so there's nothing like super new. There's some, nothing's broken. Um, Jason levels a bit. He creates a few new types of the undead, but he doesn't really get any like new necromancer powers. 
and on the whole, the game progression feels detailed, but it's a little more muni this time around. Like the author really did focus less on like new game mechanics and, and a bunch of cool things like that. And instead of like, oh, this is the story for the in-game stuff. This is the story for the real world stuff. Um, but still, nothing is badly done in any way, shape, or form. It's just, you know, if you've read books one and two, everything's going to feel familiar and that's that's okay. Um, overall, a good story. Um, there's, I should warn you, there is a cliffhanger at the end. It's a thing for the author. He wants you to read book number three. It, it's nothing that ruins or stops you from enjoying the rest of the book. It's just like, oh, this is a hook for book number four. He wants you to read it as soon as possible, obviously. So that's that's why it exists. Um, for, for me, I had a good time with it. Gets a score of 7.5 out of 10. That's a Wiccan Online. Book number three, Evolution, with a score of 7.5 out of 10. There you go. Okay, next one. It's going to be Kaki Little BD, uh, Caverns and Creatures Short Story by Robert Bevan. This one is about th 30 pages, I'd say. Um, again, no official page count from Amazon at the time of this recording. Uh, it's about, it's 99 cents. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, and here's the author's description. Um, do you like a little cocky in your little RPG? Are you looking for a play-by-play -play guide to picking up women in a fantasy game world? Are you open to a widening Oh, to widening the range of your search for essential satisfaction to the phylum level, uh, then this book is for you. <laughs> it's like this whole series of the creatures and caverns uh, and most of the stuff that Robert Raven has written is all very humorous. It, 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 it's, it's snarky. It's irreverent uh, for a lot of like genre tropes for fantasy and little RPG. Um, and as you can see from the cover, it, it's sometimes very um, in... I want to say inappropriate, but it's it's there's cursing and there's sex stuff and there's uh, potty humor galore. Um, so if you're into that kind of humor, this series is definitely going to make you laugh and giggle like it does me. Uh, in some ways, I'm still like a, a I have a very <laughs> little boy guy to eat for sometimes. Uh, but the story itself is basically about the the guys in the group getting drunk and their efforts to get Cooper laid. Um, there's a bunch of like stupid theories about the guys uh, the guys kind of come up with about like oh what's the best way to to get a girl to get, you know get a one night stand um, and and it's just it's just like a bunch of stuff like that um, that anybody who's gone through a dry spell will be able to relate, relate to um, though again there's a warning in advance there's a lot of cursing there's a lot of potty humor there's a lot of like um, sex references um, and like in, in a very humorous kind of way. There was no actual sex here. Um, and it's, again, very funny if you like that kind of stuff, if you're into, like, Kevin Smith stuff or, like, um, just, like, sometimes raunchy sense of humor, but with, like, RPG portions of it because the, the story is still set in the game world of the Caverns and Creatures universe. Um, you'll have a good time with this. Um, if, if that stuff is not for you, if you don't enjoy that kind of thing, it's okay to skip this. It's, it's, it's still a really good read. I mean... It's a nice way to support the author in between like his major releases. Um, for me, I had a good time with it. Gets a score of 7 out of 10. I've always really enjoyed uh, everything Robert Bevan has written. It's very, very funny if you're if the humor lines with you. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, it doesn't. It's okay. Uh, for me, again, that's a score of 7 out of 10 for Cocky, Little BG, Caverns, Creatures. Um, here we go. Okay. Next, we have... Um, Vilmora, a literal lit RPG, Knox Asylum, book number one, written by W. Wolfa. There you go. Uh, this one is 606 pages. It is $5.99. That is not on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, so there you go. Here's the author's description. The Kingship Tournament is starting soon, but the price for entry is high. When an old VR MMORPG gets updated to the newest generation of consoles, there are bound to be some glitches. Unfortunately for Colin, a veteran player of the original game, there are more than just a few, and they've, they've turned most of Lamora into a glitch-filled wasteland. But Colin doesn't have the luxury of sitting around in the safe, bug-free zones, building up the player town that he and his new friends started together. The Kingship Tournament is starting soon, and the leader of their group has set their sights on the throne. The entry fee is steep, and the deadline is short. Their only option is to venture into the wasteland and hope that they come out on the other side in one piece. There we go. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of the Velmora is the first book in the Nox Asylum trilogy and weighs in about 110,000 words. Uh, then there's some other descriptions. Okay, uh, again, this is not a bad story in any way, shape, or form. It's just one that I didn't connect with personally. Um, the 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 author's description does a really good job of telling the premise and that this is a revamped um, virtual game. Uh, world, this is a revamped MMO that 
has been ported into a virtual reality system. Um, and it changed hand turned developers. There's a whole like backlog and um, background story that goes into the beginning of this novel. Uh, but basically the, the main character and a few other people have, have re logged in after supporting them on Kickstarter and they get a chance to play this game. Unfortunately, it's still full of glitches and, and there's a, a, a chance for like a few characters to have some long-term um, goals from the old MMO come to fruition uh, that I'm not going to spoil for you. Um, but it's basically a group of characters who go off on an adventure and go off on and try to be this like really difficult, seemingly impossible um, quest line uh, for like some reputation points so they can do well in this upcoming tournament uh, for a chance to get, become kings and queens of the game or something. Um, for me, though, um, there are some good things here. There really are. Uh, the game mechanics are fairly thorough. They're well explained. Um, there's some interesting fights and tactics. Um, but for me, the I just had a hard time connecting. And that, and then it's one of those things like I'm, I'm reading it. I'm like a quarter and I'm like, oh, okay, this is, this is, but maybe it's interesting. And then halfway through, I realized I don't care about anybody. Like it's, I was halfway through the story and I realized, you know what? I just don't connect with any of the characters I, I i don't know enough about them to understand their motivations i mean to a degree there there's an explanation there but it's nothing that i was like particularly interested i'm like somebody hurts your friend and now you want to beat the game to get out you know back at them i'm like oh that doesn't that doesn't really resonate with me um and, and much less like the big quest that they have. Like there's like, as the game goes on, as the story goes on, more and more characters you add. It's like, it's first the one main character and the secondary third and fourth. And as each, as the group expanded, I realized like, I don't care about anybody. Like I, I don't hate them or anything. They're not like badly written characters, but there was really not enough background information as the story went on for me to like really <laughs> want them to succeed in any way, shape or form, or like really care if they died. Um, and, and that's just, a consequence of the particular story choices here. Um, and for me, maybe it'll be different for you if you happen to ch a chance to pick this up and read it. But for me, I'm like, I'm reading the story and I'm like, okay, this is, this isn't bad in any way, shape or form. The writing's fine. It's just that I didn't care about the characters and I'm like already more than, I mean, the, the point where I realized like, I'm halfway through the stream, I'm like, I don't really care. Uh, if like this main character dies or like the girl dies or like, you know, wherever, um, and I finished the novel and it's just like, oh, it's, it's, it's a fine action story. Like all the quests are set up very well. The descriptions are nice. Uh, and like the motivations, for, like the longer quests line, I'm like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess that's a reason to do this. Um, but that's the kind of the way it all. So I'm like, for me, just didn't really work. Um, just get to score six out of 10. Didn't work for me. May work for you. Uh, that's a more a glitch for a little bit. Gene Knox, silent book number one with the score six out of 10 and just because I, I didn't connect with the character. So it made it hard to, for me to care about uh, what they did. There you go. Okay. Next is going to be guardians of the round table, Dick uh, table number one, book number book number one, dexterity fail. Um, we have three authors, uh, Avril Sabine, storm Preston and rise Peterson. I think that's what it says in there. Um, so there you go. It is, uh, 216 pages, uh, not available in Kindle limited. It is $2 and 99 cents. And I think I have like the author's name wrong. Um, no, no, that's it. They're all there. So there you go. I'm incorrect. So those are all the authors. So I want to double check. I want to make sure I give everybody credit. Um, again, so it's 216 pages, $2 and 99 cents. It is not available in Kindle limited. And here's the author's description. When all actions have repercussions, it really isn't a game. Mallory's brother brings home the wrong game disc. His latest disaster doesn't surprise her one bit. What does surprise her is being transported to a role-playing style world where they check out when they check out the plain black disc. When you're a noob in a world, you don't understand death is always imminent. They aren't sure if they, they want to leave Inadon, that's the name of the game world, even if they can find a way to return home. But they do know that they need to either get good or they're likely to learn what happens when a player runs out of revives. This story was written by Australian authors using Australian spelling uh, and phrases and language. So to be aware of that. Um, this is a slice of life transported to a game world story. Um, four teens in this novel are sent to a fantasy world, fantasy RPG world where they go on quests and prove their skills and figure out the game rules of the world. Uh, there's a long-term role of joining the Guardians of the Round Table, which is the title of the series, um, but most of the story revolves around the group doing quests in a starter village. Uh, the game mechanic-wise, it's a very familiar system. Stats, class skills, crafting skills, character sheets, all the good stuff, plenty of detail. 
Um, there are possibilities that are set up in the in the in the game mechanics where players can multi class to and learn every single class that's available. So you could potentially have um, the main character. Uh, she starts out as a mage, but later on in the series she may turn into like a mage melee hybrid with, with ranged abilities and maybe pet added on and healing classes. Um, so I think the the game mechanic wise, the there are a lot of potentials builds there. But in this particular um, novel in, in the series, it's fairly standard. Like there's a there's a mage, there's a, a ranger, there's an art, um, a tank, and you know a healer. So it's not everything's pretty standard in this particular one. But there is the possibility for for class skills to open up into a much wider branch here. Uh, but in this one, fairly standard stuff. Um, overall, this is a good read. Like, it, it really is just slice of life with, like, some teens from Australia um, that that get this word game that teleports to, to, to a, a RPG world, basically. Um, and they just go on adventures, and it's it's an entertaining time. The, the, the best thing about this particular novel, it's not like the game mechanics. Everything is fine. Like, the action adventure is cool. The fights are fine. Um, but the thing that kind of drew me in and made this really enjoyable for me was the banter between the characters. Like, they're all four friends. They're all about the same age. And, of course, the small bunny romance between the main character and another member of the group. Um, it was, like I said, it was it's very entertaining as far as, like, following them on their adventures. But the, the big draw is the characters. The characters are interesting. The char- I cared about the characters. I knew things about their personalities that differentiated them. So even if I don't, like, have, like, a, a dialogue tag from the way they spoke and the jokes they made, I could actually tell who, who was speaking. Um, and everybody has a unique personality and they have their own motivations and they have their own fo- uh, foibles. Um, and the characters are kind of the draw here. Um, I'm, I'm the, the rest of the world is it's, it's decent. It's nothing wrong. There's nothing outstanding about it. Um, and the, and there is potential for like a lot of interesting things in the story, especially considering that there are, um, I don't want to spoil this, but there are real world implications for the things they do in the game. And I think that's potentially a really good storyline for, for a longer series. It, it doesn't really come into play here necessarily. Um, but again, there's a lot of potential, I think within this particular novel. Um, I will admit though, that some of the real world stuff where it's the beginning, um, or anywhere else, uh, uh, is, wasn't the most exciting. And that's mostly just on me because, um, there's no RPG stuff there. So I'm like, Oh, okay. My, what's like the, the little RPG parts of story sometimes. And I'm like, my, my attention kind of goes, Oh, <laughs> you know, so it's, I, that, that, I'm just saying. Um, so for me though, I had a really good time with it. It's enjoyable. It's a score seven point four out of ten. Uh, had a good time with it. Uh, so there you go. And I'm looking forward to reading Book Number Two. And again, there's just I think there's potential in this in this novel in this series. So I had a good time with it, and I'd look forward to reading the next one. That's Guardians of the Round Table, Book Number One, Dexterity Fail, uh, with a score seven point four out of ten. So there you go. And just be aware though that it is it's very Australian. So um, there are some phrases and, and things and then and, and, and speech patterns um, that are going to make be novel and exotic. I guess I don't know. There you go. Okay, uh, next review uh, number five. Uh, it is called "The World Jumper: A Little RPG Adventure," the uh, Diddy Dream Chronicles book number one, written by Chip Munster, which is a pen name for for the author. Um, it is uh, three hundred fifty pages. It is three dollars ninety nine cents. It is also not available in Kindle Limited. And again, you're going to see more and more of these um, that just aren't available in Kindle Limited because. A lot of, like I said, a lot of authors have gotten like those Amazon letters, and this is outside of review, of course, but it's going to be a thing, unfortunately. Um, okay. Here's the author's description. When the game world is broken, the rules don't matter. You need to discover the real world rules. Sarah's boyfriend, Mike has been kidnapped and trapped into a virtual reality game. She must enter the virtual multiverse to rescue him, but she quickly discovers that this game is unlike any other in a cybernetic landscape with thousands of worlds that are constantly evolving. Trapped players are being pushed around the realm to realm according to the whims of the mysterious Game Master. As she faces varying threats and acquires indispensable skills, Sarah soon realizes that this game can't be won by playing the rule by playing by the rules. Her only chance to rescue her boyfriend and make it out of the game alive is to beat the Game Master at his own metagame. But first, she'll have to make her way across the different realms by fighting zombies, goblins, bandits, and beasts made with the, fab- with the fabric of fear. Who is the Game Master? Why is he doing this? And is there still time to find a way to defeat him or is it already too late? Will Sarah be able to rescue Mike or will they both end up trapped forever in the virtual nightmare? So there you go. That's that's uh, actually I'm honestly pretty 
good description of the main plot points of the storyline. Um, for me, though, uh, <laughs> this story is kind of a mess. And it's very confusing. Um, and, uh, the part of the story for this particular novel was that the author had previously published it. He pulled it down because of some reviews. Um, and he tried to fix things. He tried to actually make it a better story. And he's republished it here. It, it's very upfront about it. Um, on the cover, it actually says second edition. Uh, so the author isn't hiding this in any shape or form. Um, but uh, I can understand why there were uh, criticisms of the novel. Like I said, it, there are some plot holes in the story. Um, and again, it, it's kind of confusing. Um, the prologue is, is a perfect example, if you want to download a, a sample of this, of, of, of how it just kind of drops you in the story and it doesn't always explain things and things shift around. The prologue is super confusing because it literally does drop you in. And, and it's one of those things that this is one of those storytelling things. Like when an author will tell you like some uh, set up a scene and show you a scene that occurs later in the storyline. Of, 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 of the telling. So it could be the middle. In this case, I think it's more towards the end, um, but it drops you in there and it says like, oh, these are people, these are characters. These are things that they're doing. We're going to name for you. I'm not going to explain anything. And then we're going to jump to like the regular part of the story where it starts at the beginning. And, and it's, like I said, it was very confusing because there's no explanation. It's just like, oh, the people with names are doing things and saying things. And there's some game terms thrown in there. Um, and there's a lady falling from the sky and she has a glider, but she also has lasers and they're going to fight a dragon maybe. And again, this is all, these are all things in the prologue. So I'm not spoiling anything. Um, and, but then after that, she's like, bam, onto the story. Uh, and, and, and that's the story that I, that I point on. It's, it, it, it's what the author describes in the, in the game description and in the novel description rather. The main character, Sarah, she she's going into an unfinished full immersion game that, that she had previously worked on um, be, to rescue her kidnapped boyfriend, who for no explained reason got kidnapped, and and he was trapped in this game. Um, there there are some implication. There are some um, Im, Im, yeah, implications. I guess that's the right word. Um, there's some reasons that are kind of implied that he was why well, he's trapped. But it's never really stated. Um, and it's it's kind of this whole setup uh, is just kind of super improbable, and it kind of stretches the the suspension of disbelief near to the breaking point. Like the whole setup of the series or the, of the novel um, is it's just a little weird and it's a little odd, and and it's hard to kind of take. But again, it's it's kind of a characteristic of the story in that this is a very fantastical kind of story. Uh, now, after character creation in the novel, which is again very thorough. Um, uh, where the main character gets and get to choose her appearance or her name. Uh, she's basically wanders around this game world, which is like a multiverse doing quests, um, learning a little about the game, um, killing some stuff. And then like the entire game world on a very regular basis shifts settings. Like it starts off. This is a little bit spoilery um, to be aware. Um, it starts off in a forest and then it shifts to another place within the game world and another place and another place and another place. And those shifts, each one of those things, um, are different kinds of game worlds. Like one is like super sci-fi. Some one other one is like zombie apocalypse. Another one is like again straight fantasy. Um, and and they they can incorporate different kind of game mechanics in those worlds. Like one again, zombie apocalypse is very survivalist. Um, and other ones have like different game mechanics, like tower defense or something, right? And and so on, on the basis of like, oh, that's a great interesting way of telling a, a lot of different kind of uh, a, a story potentials. I give the author credit in that he 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 chose to do it this way, and he gives them both pinchers like or, or, or putting his main characters in and crossing boundaries into different genres, um, sort of in like game genres. And in that respect, it does a great job. Um, unfortunately, the constant shifts in setting and game mechanics and and game rules kind of brings along other issues into the story in, in that. Um, game mechanic wise, they don't really matter because, um, each world has their own system. So the rules that are in, in one world, um, just when you're starting comfortable or just when you're maybe on the verge of understanding things just suddenly shift. So it feels like all that effort you, you put into like understanding it didn't matter. And, 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 and that's part of, I should say the theme of, of the story in that the, it's, it, it, it's meant to impose 
uh, a sense of helplessness on the main character in that she has to struggle along these things and are always constantly learning. And it feels a little futile for her because um, she doesn't have control of what's happening around her in the world. And so she learns how to control um, her limited ways of, of, of her interacting with the world, her powers, her skills, her stats, all those things carry over over and over. Um, unfortunately, nothing else really does. So like all th the weapons and abilities and or um, I should say like the items she carries from world to world will shift. So in one world in the fantasy world, she'll have a sword and she'll have a, you know, what, everything else. And in the next world, that sword will actually change into a shotgun or into a sniper rifle or to like a laser rifle or whatever it is, right? Um, and again, it's just, it's that constant shifting that makes it also a challenge though for the reader, uh, at least in my case, to really like a world or, or to really feel like it exists or to feel like it's fleshed out because again, it's, you know, it's going to change again. And so it's hard. It was hard for me at least, um, to really appreciate and to really like be invested in either the world of the game rules or even characters, um, because there was so much shifting around here. Um, and so for me, while I appreciate the variety of worlds and the different game mechanics, um, and I get a lot of game nods to the story, there really wasn't enough depth in each world, um, either in background or in, or in game mechanic wise or world building, I should say, uh, for me to really be entertained. And I was kind of bored to be honest. Um, I may have liked the main characters, uh, the main character as a character. She was very interesting and she had good motivations, um, which are set up very well in the beginning of the story. Um, but I stopped caring about what she was doing because I knew where it was going to end. Um, and, and so everything else felt like it was just kind of filler to get her to that point. Um, and so for me, I just, I just couldn't be engaged with the story because again, everything kept shifting and as it's just hard, it, it's just hard to like get into the story because you knew everything was going to change, but to, I, at the same time, I knew where the story was going to end. So I knew the beginning, I knew the end, just, everything else was just like a journey to get her there. Um, and for me, that just wasn't entertaining. It didn't work for me. I, I, I just, most of the story is just like, oh, okay, this is a thing. Is this person going to die? No, I don't really care. Um, so the, it is what it is. Uh, for me, again, just didn't connect. Uh, for me, it could score five out of 10. Again, not necessarily a, a badly written story. Um, it just didn't really entertain me. So there you go. That's world, the World Jumper, a little bit adventure, the Diddy Dream Chronicles book number one with a score of five out of 10. There you go. Okay, next is going to be free to play restart on Helmo's strongest F2P uh, F2Pier, f 2 a Little Regine web novel volume number one. That is all one title, ladies and gentlemen. It <laughs> uh, written by Mochi Mochi Ogain. Also a name. Uh, it is 203 pages, $2.99. Uh, it is available on Kindle Unlimited, so you can actually read this one on Kindle Unlimited if you have, if you have that. Okay, here is the... Um, Novel description: Forced to restart on hell mode against a bunch of pay to a bunch of pay to win cheaters. Bring it on! Uh, looks, talent, family background. Tinyu had them all, but when it was discovered that he had a potential game-breaking ability, he was banished from the inner circles of the world by the great fam uh, families of the world in fear that he would potentially break the delicate balance of power between the great families. Now powerless, hopeless, and almost clueless about the world outside of the inner elite. Tinayu finds a group of friends with whom he works together to try and grow and protect themselves as well as those around him. But in this world, where money trumps hard work, where connections trump talent, can the group really compete against those with silver spoons in their mouths? Um, the author describes this as a random blend of Kwaishi Fashi, I don't know this word, uh, H by H, Mandanji, One Piece, and more in a very unique Minecraft setting. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, a story that focuses on hoarding levels, money, items, instead of focusing on character and action, follow Tinyu and his friends as the, on their quest to become strong enough to uh, Zambaji, uh, their way to the top of the world in this little RPG web novel. Uh, so there you go. That's the author's description. Lots of words. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Um, honestly, the story has issues. Um, one of the biggest being that it's not actually a little RPG. Um, it, it says a little bit in the title. It says it in the um, not on the description, but there is no RPG progression or even really mechanics. At most, there's a magic system that has lever levels of like, expertise, and there are references to like these levels. Like, oh, you need to be a master level uh, in cube in this cube magic to really do this thing. Uh, and stuff like that. And there are references to a lot of video game stuff and anime stuff throughout the entire story. So like you could tell like the author is definitely influenced by RPG games or like um, 
you know, a little bit or, or other web series, like especially like Chinese kind of um, and Korean kind of story, little bit stories. Um, you can you can definitely feel the influence there. Uh, but this is basically a fantasy story where the author is describing some things in this world uh, and kind of making jokes and references uh, using those references. Um, and now, in addition to that, there are actual storytelling issues here. Like the biggest one being there's there's just a huge amount of exposition in the story. Um, this first whole first six percent of this novel is almost just like one long explanation about why the main character gets banished from his rich family and his lifestyle. There's a little bit of world building there as well, um, but it, there's basically like five sentences of dialogue in the entire like six percent of this novel, um, which comes out to being like 10 pages, 10, 10, 12 pages, whatever. So 12, 12 pages of just exposition, of like somebody explaining stuff to you without any real dialogue. Um, and, and while the rest of the novel doesn't have as like big chunks of this exhibition, there are regular, like huge sections in this story of like somebody just like the, the narrator, just like explaining things to you, um, without any like dialogue or any like scenes where this is, it would have been better to like explain that way. So that's one of the bigger issues, um, and and it kind of makes it a little dry. Um, the next thirty percent of the novel um, is, is is again it's just the first thirty percent you should say is kind of this tedious magical academy story scene um, that explains the magic system a little bit, but it also introduces characters. Um, it just it just wasn't entertaining and it felt like kind of a dry. Like the first thirty percent of this novel is is it's kind of a hard to get through to be honest so at least first ring now after the 33 percent mark on the story things pick up like the action gets better the storytelling gets better and um, you get some interesting crafting mechanics um and you actually get to see these magical powers that have been talking that have been talked about for like the first 30 percent of the story um and so from the 33 percent mark on the story is not horrible it really isn't it, it, it I should say it improves. It's never like super amazing, but it, again, the first thirty percent of this is just hard to get through. Um, and so for me, um, it just took too long to to get into. The, there's like exposition issues. Uh, there are also, of course, like technical writing issues. Um, and, and but the biggest issue for me, of course, is the fact that it advertises as liturgy. It says it's in the title, and it just isn't. It's it's it it's not. That, that's a shame. So for me, it gets a score of four to ten, um, mostly because again. The, it says it's little RPG, so it sets up an expectation for a story, and it doesn't fulfill it, and it's just not true, obviously. Uh, so for me, it gets a score of 4 out of 10. That's free to play, restart on hell mode, strongest, F, you know, that's, we'll just say, the rest of the title. There you go. Uh, so there. Okay, next. Um, Perla Online, book number one, Taurus, a little bit of game lit adventure, written by Sean White. There you go. It is uh, 391 pages, $4.99. It is available on Kindle Limited. Uh, here's the author's description. In Perla Online, death is permanent, and beyond the city walls, players will find only a quick trip to zero XP. Perla Online promised to be everything other full-dive MMOs were not. Innovative, fully immersive, hyper-realistic. The game fulfilled these promises and more when all of its players were trapped inside its virtual world. There was only one escape. Defeat Foscor, a godlike necromancer ruling from the castle at the center of the Five Realms. Most players choose survival over victory. Most choose to live within the safety of the city walls. Most. Ren is not most. He wants more than survival. He wants to. He wants his life back. Beyond the walls is the first realm. The forest of Taurus where the terrible monsters, strange allies, and twisted magic strike with deadly painful force. But Ren will not back down. He will not hide in the safety while darkness ravages the world. So there you go. That's the author's description. Okay. Um, there are issues with the story. Um, the biggest, I mean, one of the most standing is that the premise is essentially the same one from Sword Art Online. So if you've seen that anime, if you've read those light novels, um, it, it's the exact same premise um, in that the bunch of players playing this full immersion game and uh, some, some guy takes over and he says that you're trapped there and pain, pain thresholds are hundred percent. And if you want to escape the game, you must beat me. Um, and so it's not, it's not the most original way to start off a story. Um, but I also understand that as, as a reader, as like, a, I'm, I'm going to try, I'm going to try with it myself. You got to start somewhere. Uh, and so, um, being inspired by something you enjoy and love is not the biggest, you know, it's not the biggest deal in the world. Um, but that it, it, it does kind of reflect, um, the, one of the issues in the story, at least the biggest one for me is that 
it didn't feel original. It didn't feel like it was very different from the other things that I've read in, in, in literary RPG novels. Um, in this particular um, book in the series, the big the big thing to do is that the main characters are all trapped there, of course, um, and as a group, their their big goal is to defeat this mini boss in this in this first level of the game, um, and that's their goal. So that's that's the big thing that they're doing. Um, there are some things that the author did in the story that were unique and interesting that I thought were were a little bit fresh, um, and and the biggest one of there, of course, is the is the classes that are available to the main character. If you look at the cover, it's it's a very like um, blunderbuss flintlock kind of. Um, gun there looking and that's kind of the biggest thing that is different about the story is the, the classes in the story the main character uses flintlock pistols there are also summoners and tamers uh, alongside traditional warriors mages and healers the game mechanics in the story are well explained um abilities are automatically assigned and there's no like extra skill choices or anything um there is a little bit of crafting but it, it basically revolves around oh using mana to make stuff which is not like super engaging um but other than that nothing in this novel really set it apart from a lot of the other stories that i've read um most of the stories is them going on quests going from place to place doing a little exploration but mostly like killing stuff and doing action adventure things um and following like this quest line of like oh how to beat this boss how to figure it out um you know, and that that's it. That's that's what it is. It's not um, none of the main none of the characters in the story were, were particularly interesting. You get a little bit of background information on some of them, um, and a little bit of motivation, but nothing that made me say nothing made me fall in love with them. I think the character I liked the best was Boris the Bear, uh, and he was he's someone's pet in the story. Like he's for one of the tamers. Um, and the fact that I like the bear the most, who doesn't talk, who who doesn't have like a lot of like super personality traits, kind of reflects like, oh, the other characters aren't as interesting as the bear pet. Um, and that's kind of the thing that made me not really enjoy the story the most. Um, again, it's not bad really written. I don't think it's bad in any way before I just I just wasn't engaged. I was kind of bored when I read it. Um, and that's mostly because, oh, the beginning premise is like, oh, I've I've seen that before. And as they're adventuring and as they're fighting and as they're doing these things, although it's not poorly written or anything, um, the same kind of thoughts just came, kept coming up in my mind. Like, oh, I've I've seen that before. Um, I've I've seen the storyline. I've seen you know these presentations. Um, and and for me, it's just like, oh, I've I feel like I've read this story before. Um, especially considering that it, it does base its premise on something that's super popular. Um, and I just couldn't get into it. I just I the characters. Again, this is one of the things for me, at least. If I don't love your characters, I don't care what they do. I don't care if they win. I don't care if they die. You know, and, and that might happen somewhere in the story, uh, especially with the permadeath kind of uh, premise. Um, and when that happened, I was just like, meh, oh, okay, sorry. Um, and that, again, overall, the story is just like, I'm like, oh, it felt a little sloggy because, again, I, I don't, I didn't care enough about the characters that I wanted them to succeed. And I wanted them, I know, I, you know, I wanted to go on the journey with them and I wanted them to do well and get new powers and stuff. Um, so that it is what it is. I just couldn't get into the story. I give it a score of five out of 10. Uh, that's Perla online book. Number one, um, Taurus uh, with the score of five out of 10. I just didn't think it was particularly entertaining. Got a little bored. There you go. So there you go. Okay, uh, on to our last review. Uh, it is written by Michael Sisa, Lord of the Apocalypse. There we go. Got some goblins here. It is 190 pages. It is two dollars ninety nine cents. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. Here's the author's description. After being falsely accused of murder, Nicholas Dredd finds himself losing not only seven years of his life but also his son and wife. Fate further kicks him in the chest when he suddenly finds himself in the middle of the unannounced apocalypse, witnessing deaths by the thousands. After a desperate struggle, he dies only to find himself in a body of a goblin. So there we go. Short. Okay. Um, I really like this novel. I really like this story a lot. Um, it's a gritty, it's dark, it's graphically violent, and it is a little RPG. Um, it, it, to me, it's great. Um, it combines an apocalypse story with the re reincarnation story. You might have seen them online or the places that's just like RE, um, colon, I think it is. Um, and these stories usually like have the main character just like um, dying and then reincarnating as like a monster or some kind of creature. And you kind of get to see the story from uh, a different point of view. Instead of being a human, you get to see the evolutionary path of some of the creature, in this case, it being a goblin. Um, 
the main character, Nicholas, is caught up in, like, in the apocalypse. He's trying to save his family. And then he wakes up reborn as a goblin spawn, which is the lowest level of goblin here. Um, he has to figure out how to gain levels to get more powerful and somehow get back to Earth to save his family from the monsters killing humans for food. Um, and again, I, I want to forewarn you, this is super dark. Like, this is super graphic. Um, it's a very it's a very dark story. Like, there's a lot of blood and murder and, like, uh, dismemberment. Um, so just, just be aware that this is not, this is definitely not for kids. Um, and so, but if you're into the kind of story, if you, if you like something different, you're probably going to enjoy this a lot. Game mechanic wise, it uses familiar stats, skills, XP system. Um, it also adds the ability for the main character to evolve into more powerful goblins. Um, it's not an overly complicated system, but it's something that is seen throughout the novel. It's very, it, 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 it's very well represented. Um, it's not like again super deep. You're not having like a million skill pass or anything. Um, but again, it it has a potential for to to be interesting for the entire series. Um, story wise, again, it just follows the main character as he tries to find his family and gain more power as a goblin. Um, there's also a secondary plot with human survivors that seems to be a bigger part of the next book potentially. Um, but here in this story, there's a lot of fighting, um, both on the goblin world and on Earth. Uh, but again, it's very graphic, very violent. It's a dark story world. Overall, I thought it was a great story. It combined it for me. Basically, it got it's gonna get a score of eight out of ten because it's doing something different. Um, it, it, it's combining again this reincarnation story with a hack up story, but it's also very, the setting is very different. It's very dark and it's very entertaining for me because again, it's different. Um, I, as somebody who reviews a lot of stories in in the genre, you get a lot of fantasy action adventure stories. Um, and this, while there is action adventure, it, 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 the setting is so different. It's so grim and it's so dark that it felt refreshing in, in a way uh, because it was different. Um, and so for me, because it does, does something different and it's also short enough that you can kind of just read in in one setting and just have a nice little nugget of a story. Um, I liked it. If you like novels like Life Reset, um, that also has that same kind of concept of like, oh, the main character not being human and being a monster class. Um, and figuring out how that story and culture works, you'll like the story as well. Um, so for me, it gets a score of 8 out of 10. That's Lord of the Apocalypse with a score of 8 out of 10. Um, I finally got to read something that was different this week. So it's good for me. Okay, that's it. We're done. That's all eight stories. Um, thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen, for listening and for watching, for letting me you know, gush about little RPG and the stories that I loved. Um, if you want to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Patreon, or on our website, we'll have all the link in the show notes. And of course, links for the other Facebook groups um, who you might want to like hang out with and like, talk about little RPG stuff. And of course, if you like the podcast in any way, shape, or form, you can have all the ways you do so uh, to support us at litrpgpodcast.com slash support. Again, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for listening. And remember, folks, so we can hang out again to go read some little RPG. Goodbye, everybody.